Good afternoon. Welcome all for joining everyone. I'm sure that if you uh, shove, uh, shove over a bit, we can fit everyone. <laughs> um, today we're going to talk about some uh, key considerations for a successful OpenStack deployment. My name is uh, Bart van den Heuvel. I'm a uh, EMEA Consulting Practice Manager. Um, my name is Alberto Garcia. I'm a senior architect in the EMEA Cloud Infrastructure Practice. I'm also leading the EMEA Cloud Infrastructure Practice. Um, and I'm trying to handle this because I think that he has its own life. He's going back and <laughs> yeah. forth. So it's not my fault. It's its fault. So yeah. just to make it clear. So, part? Yeah. So um, what we're going to show you is um, the key considerations for the OpenStack deployment. Can you show me the next slide? So I would like to see a raise of hands because we would like to have this uh, a bit interactive. There's also a microphone uh, on, on that side of the room. So I would like you to share some stories or anecdotes when you feel uh, appropriate. So we're in a in an intimate session, uh, setting, so not too many people. So it's good to just uh, uh, we can we can really share some uh, some some uh, of the details of your cloud deployment here. So I would like to know who is already building or who is considering building an OpenStack cloud. Right. So I know some of you are uh, already so already done this. So who who is already running an OpenStack cloud has been through all this. Uh, 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 pain, I know you have because we've joined you in your in your journey somewhat. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. So, good. Um, so, OpenStack brings many opportunities. We've seen this morning in the in the keynotes as well that there are many industries that are are, are looking to deploy OpenStack and. Um, yeah. Sorry. It's, it's no worries. No worries. But they're they're looking for four main factors to do so. It's unifying IT, getting rid of all these uh, different uh, bare metal models, all these uh, different uh, virtual machine clusters and, and everything. So OpenStack brings that opportunity that you can really unify uh, all your IT on a single platform that you can really specialize in and, uh, and, and, and invest in. So the standardization reduces cost. I think that's why most companies do this because it's, it's, it's really simple for the eye, but it's also very good for your wallet. Uh, automation, deploying everything via APIs or via your deployment tools, uh, also reduces risks. You can test it in its eternal, in, 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 in its, um, uh, as a whole, and then press the deploy button and it will do it in a very dependable and predictive manner, hopefully. You know, most automation will do this uh, uh, in a repeatable manner. And it's also a basis for the cultural and, uh, and uh, process changes. So because your IT is now very simplified and, and under control, you can really reach out to your dev and your ops and say, look, work together. This is our uh, unified generic platform and uh, focus on automation. And this is the ba basis for a lot of cultural change because you, you have your uh, hands empty to, uh, to work on that. Okay, so this is the real world. We have risk. It's not all about opportunities. It is the real world, we can fail. This is, these are the four main risks we have seen in our experience in the field. So how many of you are techies? So botanical people love to go, yeah, a lot of people. So we are, I'm a techie as well. I'm, go, I'm used to go directly to deploy stuff. SSH into the machine, start installing things, that's fine. But the risk I have is not getting anywhere because I don't know where I'm going. I'm just trying to install stuff. Is my goal install stuff? Or is it, there is a business driver behind? I'm installing something because there is a business driver behind. So, the second thing, the second risk is too expensive. So how many of you have ended up customizing a lot of code because you know, we are techies, we can customize a certain driver, certain filter, well, let's customize it, I can do it, I'm a developer. Then you end up with a, with a platform that is really expensive to maintain. You, you need very deep knowledge on your platform. It's not a standard, this is not something you can control. 
So expensive to maintain. Bricks all the time. So how many of you had a tough schedule? I need an open stack, I need a grid open stack, and I need it tomorrow. So how many of you? A lot of you, isn't it? So we want to, to build the cloud. We want to build the cloud tomorrow, not, not, not in two months, tomorrow. So build it quick, let it hard forever. This is, the, this is the risk. So I built it quick. I didn't evaluate what I was trying to do, and it hurts forever. So I'm with the fire extinguisher every day trying to fix stuff. So, or the, le the last one is awesome. I deploy an awesome OpenStack environment, but they deploy OpenStack for its name, not for its ability. I'm trying, I'm trying to cover a use case that OpenStack cannot cover. So, or I try to onboard the, the grown users into my platform. So how many of you have seen this? For all of you that have a, a current OpenStack cloud in, in their premises. Any of you have seen these risks? Raise hands, please, don't be shy. Yeah, good stuff. So, business context of OpenStack deployment. So these are the user categories we have in, uh, in the, organization, the OpenStack organization. So, did you feel identified with any of them? You had to be in any of these categories if you are running a cloud already. So, I think that I don't... Uh, sorry. I think that we don't have to, to go through them. Also, we will be coming back to this later during the, the discovery demo. So just to say what we have seen. And, um, yeah, that's good. So um, we've seen a few project modes, approaches that um, uh, people adopt while bin building these clouds. So uh, one interesting one, and we see that with uh, several cloud providers, is build it and they will come. You want to build your IT infrastructure. You don't care too much on who is going to use it uh, right now, so you don't know any uh, details about your future customers. But you do know uh, your way around ordering hardware and setting up these clouds in a very effective uh, manner. So you will build it, and then eventually your customers will come. So there's a, uh, not a too close relationship with uh, your future uh, customers. So no real requirements together. There's also the pure practical approach, and that is what the technical people love most. So you, you, you just focus on the technical detail and you try to achieve that. So probably you'll just install your uh, RPMs and uh, it will either work or it will fail. If you fail, you think, yes, something to learn, and then you'll revisit it. And uh, if your manager comes along and says, how far along are you? And uh, when can I expect some results? You'll say, uh, I think I'm there. But uh, I don't know, it could be a week, it could be a month. So that's a pure practical approach. And I, I think that's very valid. You will learn a lot. So uh, in the end, it, it's, uh, it's a very practical but uh, uh, workable solution. Uh, there's also the pure academic approach. We see that a lot with NFV uh, in the RFP phase. There's a big book that they will release containing all the elements that they need, all the details of what they need. and. Uh, it's, it's much of this is uh, predicting the future because you don't really know uh, what will happen down the line if you need to adopt any changes or you need to uh, uh, maybe some details don't quite have the weight in reality that you think it had in the beginning. So that's why we use our preferred one and that is uh, uh, the, the modern uh, use case driven approach. This, this approach is where you uh, uh, discover um, a use case and you build a minimal viable product around it. So you, you check your business parameters, you, you, you check your uh, technical uh, uh, parameters and we'll go into what you need to get to, to actually create your minimal viable product and then go in iterations, uh, stacking um, uh, use case on use case, so you'll end up with a, with a very nice and very valid relevant deployment. Um, each uh, consideration or each um, uh, uh, use case will have to discover, design, and, and uh, uh, deploy method, and then you can stack them as you can see here. So the bottom line is the investment you make. It's the time, effort, and budget you will invest into your product. Um, uh, first, you start off simple. Um, it's a very uh, easy thing. Maybe it will take you two months, three months to, to, to build this, or 
any, any, any amount of time, and then you can manage uh, or you can uh, deploy unmanaged manage systems. Meanwhile, you can focus not only the project team but also the organization you can focus on uh, usability. It, the whole solution will mature inside your organization and it will do, work wonders on uh, acceptance of the solution. So not taking two big steps, but bite-sized chunks that will help you achieve your success in the long term, right? Is it clear so far? Yes? Okay. So here is where the interactive thing starts. So I'm keen to hear what you have to say. Because otherwise, it's just me and Bart speaking, and this is not the purpose of this, uh, of this session. So, these are the topics we cover during the design session, during the discovery session. Are you familiar with them? Do you see important facts before getting hands on the technology? Because what we usually see, and I'm going to use this is very professional because I'm going to use the pointer, <laughs> is it? is that we go directly here. Design a high-level solution for something that I have no idea. But this is what customers ask us. So I want OpenStack, you are the expert, design it. This is not the way. So what do you think that is the first step of a discovery session? What is the first thing you have to know? Anybody? The why is absolutely valid. So we like to focus on the fundamental problem or the fundamental new ability to achieve. What are we actually doing? Why are we investing this money, this time, and, uh, and this effort? Right, so, um, uh, can we go back? I think. Yeah. <laughs> the wonders of Rollback. technology. Yeah. So for instance, this, this could be, um, uh, this is a different between your your different your uh, core business drivers. This is actually what is hurting or what you would like to achieve. Like um, so, yeah. I think this it was the good slide. Yeah. Yeah. So these are very generic things. We saw them in the keynotes this morning. So uh, generic enough to just uh, 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 name them here to put them in the keynotes. So is is anyone? brave enough to step forward and to explain some of their business objectives in, in the field? Or, uh, Any of you can be a consultant that has done an OpenStack deployment and knows the, the main business objectives of uh, their customers. Guys, don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, OK. Yeah. Please. Thank you. <laughs> So I think oh, that yeah, is much better if, uh, but I can grab the. <laughs> so, I blim blim, but. Okay. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Sorry, I blim. <laughs> yeah. So, what's your name? Brett. Nice to meet you, Brett. Hi, Brett. Yeah. So, back. Why? Uh, do you have already a cloud in your premises, or you are thinking of building a cloud? We don't currently have a cloud. But no. you are thinking of? We're thinking of building one. Why? Uh, because we are using a really strange ad hoc developer platform. I've only been with the company a short period of time. So I've arrived to a company who, who are doing development on individual blades. So they've got about 200 blade servers, each one is allocated to a developer who then does what they want on KVM on that blade. And I've come from an inner state where I ran 3,000 VMs on 96 blades. Wow. And looked at the, uh, the hardware cost is about three times higher and the company's smaller. So it's very inefficient. And you, and you see OpenStack, the way to provide this infrastructure as a service to the, to the developers. Yeah, so I've, I've got a lot of experience with VMware. I've got quite a bit of experience with AWS, but only a little bit with OpenStack, which is why I'm here, because I've yeah. done an awful lot more about OpenStack. Um, but I've come into the company, and the company is saying OpenStack, because they're a completely Linux house, there's a lot of KVM in there, and some of the company, the customers who were running the software 
are doing what you want to do so on an open stack platform as well. Okay. So apart from uh, providing this uh, API-driven infrastructure to your developers, are you looking forward to a standardized infrastructure? So you have a common vendor for all the blades and this, uh, this kind of things? Yeah, so at the moment we're using one vendor for all the, the blade equipment, but then equally there are customers who are saying, I don't want to be tied to individual hardware. So you need to have that abstraction layer within there. Okay. Um, but it, it, it's, it's the time to get code in onto the systems, it's the time to build environments, it's, it's the, t the time it takes for testing. So if you, if you run an overnight test and it, it, it times out at 2 o'clock in the morning and no one's watching it, um, it there, there's so many inefficiencies. Yeah. So the, do you think that this will improve the process of onboarding new, new developers? Because currently, if you have to add a new blade, I think that this, there are long journey to get this in production, isn't it? Well, that's it. It takes, it takes eight weeks to order a piece of hardware, doesn't it? And how long does it take you to spin up a, a virtual environment? Mm. An entire network with, with that virtual networking, firewall, storage, everything. It, it, it's 45 minutes. Okay. Right. So to summarize that, it's actually true. So these, what I call generic things, because I've, I, you, you said that they're now busy on individual blades, which is not very flexible. So th th you're looking for some, some new flexible platform where you can do uh, things faster and, and uh, probably more reliable. One of the things is if someone really wants to, to, they've got a massive amount of code they need to compile, uh, and they've got the oldest blade, a five-year-old blade sitting in the, the, the infrastructure, and maybe Bob, who sits next to them, goes on holiday for a week, and Bob's got the, the newest blade in the infrastructure, and he's sitting there doing nothing. So right. all of that compute power is wasted, and this poor old guy gonna, or girl is going to be sitting there on this really old piece of hardware, taking hours to do anything, as opposed to, to trying to spread that load. Right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank Good. you very much. So this is really interesting, because now you can corner off your project. If you uh, invest some time and write down these stories, then you know what you're building, but you also know what you're not building. You build your minimal viable uh, product, so you think, this is my fundamental problem I want to achieve, and this is my, uh, uh, um, uh, or fundamental new ability that I want to uh, achieve. Right? So that also means that there's a whole world that you're not doing. It saves you an enormous t amount of time of money, time and money to have a focused starting point and take that into your business objectives. So this prevents uh, if you onboard a new uh, technical guy and he says, I've been to the OpenStack Summit, I know what OpenStack can do, uh, I, I, I want this, but I also want database as a service or, or ironic because, you know, it's fancy. <laughs> then you can say, no, no, we're focusing on these business objectives and that will make your uh, uh, OpenStack deployment uh, a lot uh, quicker and successful. So, what do you think that this is the next one? Anybody? Let's go and design. I'm a techie. I want to design something. <laughs> this is going nowhere. So, nobody? Okay. I'm from the south of Spain. I can speak all the time. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the, ne the next one is identify the core business drivers, isn't it? I know what's your fundamental problem. Then I'm going to see what is the business that is behind this problem. Because uh, guess what? The company is doing business. They build new platforms to get money or to save money. There is a reason always. So based on the business drivers, that are behind your OpenStack deployment, you are going to be categorized in one of those. So if you are a telco and you want to, to save uh, money in the TCO or you want to avoid um, <coughs> um, vendor lock-in and this, uh, this kind of things, you are going to be placed in the NFV user categories. The same uh, you will. So maybe it's good to, sh to have uh, another show of hands. So yeah. who's actually building something for a uh, public cloud provider? Who's in the business of just uh, selling out uh, uh, virtual machines and uh, be the, ne the next uh, Amazon? Okay, that's good. Who's more in the uh, NFV space, uh, working with telcos or uh, uh, virtualizing? Okay, thank you. Uh, enterprise internal cloud, maybe... Uh, uh, replacement of your current virtualization deployment. Yeah, good. 
Thanks. And what we also see, and this is very interesting, is um, uh, to support a, a specific scientific or manufacturing process, like HPC, where you actually uh, extend the capabilities of OpenStack to, to something really uh, bespoke. OpenStack is a framework of technology uh, uh, powering uh, HPC or maybe CI-CD pipelines or, or uh, along that line. So who does something really specific with OpenStack to power a specific process? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, something went wrong. Sorry. Yeah, back again. So, next step. Do you think, do you think that this is a good idea of thinking of a open st I can deploy OpenStack as a greenfield? How many of you think that you can deploy OpenStack as a greenfield? That I can drop a silo in my IT, and I think that it's going to work out perfectly, totally isolated from all the IT of the company. So, how many of you think that this is going to work out? Nobody. Yeah, you thought. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we get it a lot. So we, we, people come to us and say, we've got this uh, open stack and we want to be bimodal. So we're going to do this next to my current infrastructure. We're going to uh, assemble a new team so we can do this completely greenfield. New set of standards, where everything is new, no boundaries. This is going to be the, 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 the biggest, newest, most strategic open stack project in the world. And we're going to start off completely clean. And then we're starting, and then I'm requesting uh, uh, networks because, you know, uh, uh, you need to connect your OpenStack to, to the outside world somewhere. And then someone slips me a list of security requirements, and then I go, yeah, but I can't build my cloud based on that. And then it turns out that the green field is not all that green. It's actually a very smelly brown field uh, where, where you have to, uh, to do these considerations. So it's absolutely, absolutely necessary to be completely honest and to say, what is my current, uh, current state of my, R, uh, my IT? And this is where we actually show this maturity model. It's a bit of an old uh, slide. I think there's, is there a, no, there's no year there. But uh, we've been showing this, uh, this to, uh, to customers for, uh, for a few, few years now. And uh, when we start off uh, this conversation, we ask this uh, customer, uh, where are you in this scale? So it goes from zero to four. And uh, zero is more or less uh, what companies start out with. So they have uh, their own builds. So uh, uh, they have either on paper, automated, or they have some, uh, some image they can, they can uh, put on systems. It's called a core build, and they have a mechanism to provision it. That's where it starts, right? So there's no real inventory of systems, and there's no real uh, uh, provisioning of other things. And then there's level four, where everything is, uh, is designed and everything is uh, written down in policies, orchestration, compliance, self-provisioning, everything, uh, everything is handled. So this takes a bit of uh, uh, self-knowledge to actually go through this. So uh, most of the people we speak to, if they're completely honest, they have some elements of level four, but they really, in reality, they are in level one. And for a successful OpenStack deployment, you need to have your automated provisioning in order. Because how are you otherwise going to do uh, uh, um, the, the automated deployments? Right, so these things need to be in place. So this is interactive. So uh, I would love to hear from you. In which of these states do you think that your company is now? Anybody? No answer, no goody. <laughs> no. I don't have a problem of uh, bringing you the microphone. <laughs> Several teams in one, in two, uh, the good days. Three, four, <laughs> depends, no? Is That's it, right, yeah. yeah. And, and then it turns out that, that from yourself as an IT provider, 
you can say that you're on level two because you have your basic deployment is in order and your, your basic uh, uh, images can be deployed in an automated fashion, but then some uh, other business owner in your organization comes and says, I have all these weird new requirements. And uh, are you then, as an organization, strong enough to say, look, you need to develop into automation or you need to invest in automation. You need to make sure that you have developed uh, uh, according to company standards before you can uh, be enrolled in our platform. And that takes a bit of guts because otherwise you will have five or six OpenStack deployments that, that will cater to all these uh, different needs. So you need a very sturdy manager to uh, accept these workloads. Is that the case in your organization? For sure. Yes. <laughs> and I believe that you also have a very good security officer to uh, enforce that. <laughs> Thank you. So anybody else? Before? Yeah. So um, it's not actually my current company, but uh, when we started in my previous, previous life, uh, the company was definitely uh, in the level one, maybe something from the level two, but not, uh, not, uh, it didn't uh, even achieve uh, all of the things in the level two. Mm -hmm. so and did, did they actually go through a cloud deployment? So were they busy uh, with cloud or were Yeah, we, we end up, uh, so we first understood that uh, uh, we had to remove all of the manual activities and operations, scripting everything, either with simple, let's say, shell scripts, or with something more advanced. It, it was a few years ago, so at that time, uh, I don't think that Ansible was even out there, and uh, we choose uh, Puppet, like many others. So right. we remove all of the manual activities, uh, everything scripted, and uh, we, uh, we added uh, uh, the, the testing, testing for everything. And I, I believe that uh, uh, when I left the company, uh, we were pretty much compliant with, I believe, all every, every points in the level four, maybe except one. Right. So you accepted that automation is the only way to really make use of your, uh, your cloud deployment. So you eliminated all the manual steps. Yeah. So that's, that was your... Uh, did, was that um, uh, obvious from the start, or did you try and do some manual action? No, we we we, we tried. We, we it, it followed many iterations, and uh, so we end up uh, with uh, with uh, the final solution. Oh, thank you. Good story. I think we can learn from that. So even attempting uh, to 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 make use of your cloud deployment while you're still uh, have all these manual steps, it's probably a, not a very good idea. It's really, really necessary to focus on these things. So, <coughs> the I'm back. So, <laughs> Welcome. do you think that makes sense? So, you have a current, uh, a current IT. We have to be aware of where we are putting OpenStack in, isn't it? Otherwise, what we have, we, we have is, this bimodal IT, but really bimodal, because you are going to have one IT and another IT, and you are going to create processes for your IT A, and you have to build processes for your IT B, and you are going to divide your current IT. That makes sense? No? Yes? I can answer myself. Yes, <laughs> makes sense. Okay. You're a, you're a very tough uh, show master there, Alberto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I am very tall now. Because yes. <laughs> so, okay. So I'll, I'll I'll get to the next one. Then. Yes, please. Because this is one I think is really important and often overlooked, and that is responsibility domain. We already noticed uh, uh, that as a infrastructure provider, as a cloud provider, you have uh, a level of control. So you know what hardware you buy, you know what operating system you will run, and you have a, uh, maybe some added services that you add as a as a value add service, right? That's your responsibility as a cloud admin. Uh, it's a very restricted, very clear boundary until you get your first users that will say, uh, I will want to use your cloud uh, uh, platform. I don't care about the infrastructure. I just want to deploy this stuff. Can you give me a Windows 95 image? Right? <laughs> and that's where you, where you say, um, okay, 
uh, how am I going to do this, right? So it's very good to have a clear view on your responsibility as a cloud admin and, and, and also uh, uh, look at this with your key stakeholders to see uh, how you're going to provide the add-on services. Maybe you need a uh, image factory that will allow some tested and uh, certified images uh, before you can actually give them to your, uh, uh, to your cloud users. And at the same time for your cloud users, it's good to set uh, uh, responsibility domains there. And it doesn't stop right there. So you have the cloud admin and the cloud user. Maybe you've introduced uh, responsibilities for your vendor. Maybe you're uh, uh, accepting a, uh, a hardware vendor uh, to do some things. So normally when we go into a discovery session, this is, this is quite a, uh, an, a thick chapter in the report we make because um, uh, this is important to get straight from the start. Right. So who is a cloud admin here? Right. Only one cloud user. So we, who, who has a story to share here? Because this, this yeah, is yes. where things are really interesting. So I can ask you funny questions like uh, in your company, who is providing the images? The cloud users or the cloud admin? For instance, you, because you, you raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. So in your, in your company, who is the responsible of the cloud images? So in our company, we leave that to the cloud admins. <laughs> cloud admin, yep. why? Uh, because we provide the users with security hardened images. OK. So in this, uh, following the security topic, some companies very secure, like I know your company, I'm not going to mention it. Uh, se security groups, the ACLs apply to the network. If this is something that you allow the, cast, the, the, the cloud users to provide by themselves, or this is something that you control? It's a mix with us. So as we're onboarding our applications onto our cloud, the developers who are the cloud users are sitting with the cloud admins and working out what ACLs they need for their apps. And occasionally we're having to tell them that no, any, any is a really bad idea. Yeah. Okay. Quite loudly. So, so this, Anna, this no is very important because, um, um, so do you have uh, buy-in from your senior or executive manager? Because when there's a, uh, because I, I can foresee a power struggle where this manager says, there's no way we can accept your workload on this platform in these conditions because it's unsafe, you will expose your company. But if then the infrastructure manager is not strong enough or, or the, the power is not in balance, then, then he may be overruled and then you're still exposed. So how is that with your organization? It hasn't been a problem yet, but if it is, then um, the cloud admins would win out the day at our place. Yeah? Yeah. That is good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Anybody else wants to share ideas? You? Yeah. Can you please come? <laughs> no, I can, I can do the, I can uh, do okay. the walking. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So I just wanted to say that uh, there are a lot of companies, I believe, in where there's not such responsibility and not a dedicated uh, cloud team. You know, just a bunch of teams working together, trying to put out a cloud, but not a dedicated cloud team. So I don't know if it makes sense you know, to put uh, effort into having a, a specific team for this kind of uh, deployment. Yeah. It's a question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can say. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. So I can share my experience because, you know, I'm an architect, I've been in the field, I've seen some stuff. So, Sometimes it's not as clear as cloud admin, cloud user. Some companies work. Are you a fan of Game of Thrones? Do you know it? It's the same. So we have the kingdom of the Linux system, the kingdom of security, the kingdom of networking, the kingdom of storage, and everyone wants to manage something. Then the responsibility domains are really spread. The security team wants to secure everything, so they want to touch everything. Then the networking guys wants the not only the physical part of the network, they want to manage this specific piece of virtual networking in the cloud, and they want to manage it. So at the end, the user is doing nothing. 
because <laughs> all these teams are trying to handle everything by themselves. So this needs to be set up at the beginning of the project, before starting the project. And everyone needs to be in the same room and they have to agree to the responsibility domains. Otherwise, in the middle of the design phase, what you are going to get is when you think that it's done, a new stakeholder is going to come and say, no, no, this is my piece of the platform. I want to do this thing. And you will never end in getting new requirements. So this is a really important part of the project. Before the project, I would say. Do you agree? No. Yes. And this is also a very key argument why you need project management at the early stages of your proje project. Because ne this needs to be identified, it needs to be written down, and also well, enforced sounds like uh, you're in battle. But you, you need someone to say, look, this is what we agreed on. And, and yeah, kind of enforce it. Yeah. Shall, shall I take over? Yeah. I'm not used to uh, single single mouse button systems. Yeah. Okay. So pop uh, pop. Let's look at uh, no, timeline. Time? Yeah. So next thing is before you click. What is the you know when you 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 start thinking about timelines? What is the date that you usually get? The? Yesterday. No. Yeah, yesterday. Right. You usually get the go live, isn't it? So all the project is the go live date. So nothing is happening in the middle, isn't it? So you have to deliver a cloud 28th of March of uh, 2030. No? But the, the reality is that, sorry, Bart. No worries. No, I know my place. Is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's my laptop. I am yeah, only. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Things happen in the middle. So, and these are very easy ones. Uh, could be that certain team needs to certify the new software before you start deploying it. This is two months delay. If you don't think about this constraint before you start the project, you are going to estimate the ground effort. You are going to estimate ground the resources. So, I would love to, to know which are the constraints in your a specific environment that will affect the timeline of a possible OpenStack project. Anybody? Okay. Okay. I'm guilty. I'm a security guy, so one of the constraints is security. Yeah. And, and, and you have to think about security at the beginning of the project. If you do it at the end, uh, and what is going to happen is that it's not going to be secure. Because if you try to do it close to the, you know, if you onboard a major player at the end of the project, what is going to happen is that all the people are going to say, no, you are going in the next release. No, you're going to be the stopper. Or the stopper. Mm -hmm. But if you cannot stop the project, you are going to be, you are not going to be the priority, isn't it? The, the security is just a business. It's a, it's in fact, you have to do anything security. Yeah, okay. And this is, this is a very good argument why we like the minimal viable product connected to a roadmap uh, so much. Because if security is this important, then you can have a minimal viable product start with an unsecure environment that you don't put in production, but just uh, uh, um, install and then make sure that, that you have a platform to actually test and validate it on the security level, right? Your colleagues is gonna be how useful you are if you are in, involved at the beginning of the project. Right. I and mean, so then you start out with an MVP that is not secure, and one of your future use cases is to actually deploy a secured and validated. Uh, uh, but then you you really enable yourself to do it, because if you want to do all these things in one go, then you uh, you may not have the ability to control it because then you have your timelines and, and, and you're, not, you're not really um, uh, uh, dependable or seen as dependable. Right? Anybody else? Because sec security is one thing, but uh, uh, we, we build clouds for a living. Somet and most times we, we were asked to join projects when uh, there's already a date for the hardware to be delivered. Right? So we, we have no real control on the actual hardware design or, or uh, things, which I think is a pity. 
I also like, really like building clouds, so I don't know why all these people do this in, in such a hurry. <laughs> so again, so uh, I prefer to give you some stories, so I'm going to, to use my experience on that, so you can have examples of what I try to say here is that, for instance, in one customer, during the discovery sessions, we figured out that we needed four months just to execute penetration tests and the certification of the new software in lab. And plus these four months, we had to request the resources with two months in advance. So if you start assuming dates, the go live date was not realistic, isn't it? So you tell me that in four months I had to build a cloud, but you have a process that lasts six months, it's not going to work out, isn't it? So this is the value of looking at these things before you start the project. Because if you don't look at this, you are starting a project that could be a failure before even started. Because you cannot deliver on date. So, sorry. I, I cannot hear you, sorry. So the question is, why is this different for cloud? Yeah, well, I mean, this is true for any project. You need a project management planning and everything. So why is it different for cloud? So that is a very good question, because that in a simplified view, a manager sees things uh, as simple as they can. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a new manager, so I'm, I'm, I know what I'm talking about here. So <laughs> it's true. So what is the problem? Why wouldn't you uh, do this? So my experience with OpenStack, as a framework of technology, you accept so much new technology, so much new way of working, a new way of deploying uh, uh, all these workloads, software-defined networking, software-defined storage, all these concepts are pretty new for a storage uh, 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 admin that has never done anything else than just NetApp or... or, or uh, uh, so that's why I think these projects are really different. It's a whole new level of complexity. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and also... just. It's also it's not you, you didn't develop this. Right. <laughs> and you could go down the community uh, road, cause it, but I'm, I'm, I'm going into a red hat I mean, commercial area. <laughs> because you didn't develop. If you have developed, you know what it is, and you, you're taking it and deploying it, right? And so, yeah, that's the thing. The, the question that I have is, when you build the cloud, do you put restrictions to the, you know, like the, the cloud team, that there are team squads in the, in the cloud team, and there are experts who can fix the problems, but do you, how do you control as you build the, build the cloud, right? Um, do you start from the beginning um, to enforce, you know, how a real cloud should work? So the squads will get experience building, you know, during the building and deploying of the cloud, before mm -hmm. if it is before before it even goes live, um, the squads will get experience. So we put control so that they put the control in such a way that the cloud isn't already in production, as far as the clouds are the squads are concerned. I think you're you're onto something here because it does take some self-discipline with all these uh, uh, wonderful features of OpenStack that just enable everything and say we will accept any, any workloads because uh, cloud providers like AWS, they also don't, don't care about workloads, right? But now you really have to look at your responsibility domains, where you draw the line between cloud provider and cloud user and who you accept as a cloud user, right? Yeah. So you have something to decide at the beginning when you look at your business requirements, look at your use cases, uh, uh, who are my customers and what are the boundaries of what I accept so that's part of the uh, uh, responsibility domains. And it does require a lot of discipline. And maybe it, it requires you adjusting your project parameters. If it turns out that a big stakeholder has a change in their project and, uh, uh, and he's one of the main suppliers for your budget, that means that you, you may have to rethink uh, what, what kind of workloads you accept. Uh, and it's also a bit of a commercial for the MVP uh, approach with, with iterations working towards a new uh, thing. Because in, in a big academic approach, you would have to go back to the drawing board, reset your boundaries and, 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 and redesign the whole thing. And now you can say to this customer, 
uh, in, internal customer, we recognized that this new workload uh, uh, was not originally designed to be on this, but we can uh, uh, design a new iteration, especially for you, where we can adjust your, our cloud platform and we can give you a date, right? So we'll start this work on that and then we'll invite you to the table to reset the balance for the responsibility domains and, uh, and come to a, a new, better solution for the company. So you see, the further we go into these tiles, uh, the, com the complexity increases because uh, identifying core elements of your business is one thing, and when you then uh, add time to it, and uh, 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 so this will all become clear when we do use case prioritization and uh, and the roadmap. So you see, we have some some props here. There are already some post-its, uh, mega size, thanks to. Uh, Roman. To Romain. <laughs> Thank you, Romain. And, and this, these, this material is normally what we use. So as you can see here, we, we have uh, 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 the room. This was actually in, in, in Switzerland, where we have um, uh, everyone. Or well, maybe you can explain it. Yeah, because actually, I am the fat guy in the <laughs> white t-shirt. So yeah, what we do is, uh, are you familiar with user stories? Raise your hand, please. Yes? That's good. That's more than half. Yeah, more than half is impressive. So what we do is that because use cases sometimes are very fluffy. So it's better to use user stories because for a human being, it's easier to expose a requirement or a user, user story as me as the user. Like uh, me as Alberto, I want to authenticate against LDAP. So we start to map these user stories in these fancy um, post-its on the wall. We start to categorize them in columns like authentication, virtualization, storage. And at some point, we have a clear view of what your users are going to do in your system. Isn't it? Is that clear? This is the end result, all these things. And at some point, the product owner or the main architect or the people that is doing the, the kind of the authority of the system is going to decide what is the first release, what's in the second release, and what's in the third release, what is so-called roadmap. So, because you have all the, st all the stuff that you want in your system, so it's very easy to go with a tape. You go, this for authentication, for me, is a priority to get it authenticated with LDAP. I don't, need, I don't need federation, so for the next release. And the same with the rest of the categories. Does it look fancy, isn't it? And it's an easy and very, how to say, natural and organic way of working in these uh, complex concepts. That you, imagine that you try to, to map all of this just talking in a, in a meeting. It's mainly impossible to do it. You can do it, but it's not going to be as clear as this because human beings are more used to see and try to, to get the, the stuff tangible, isn't it? In our experience, I think this is a very active way to, uh, to gather this information, and it also enables people to, uh, to get over their chairs and to uh, uh, fiddle about with the information a bit, and uh, you'll actually get some really good results. So it's not only collecting the information and storing it on the wall, uh, uh, but you also a very active involvement from people uh, that are in there. Actually, funniest. There, there, there are some risks in doing this because yeah. we, we've been with customers where they say, oh yeah, we need this, we need this, we need this. So we need to have an, a, a, also a very decisive and authoritative product owner to actually say, look, this is, this is something relevant or this is something that is a really good idea, but may not fit with our uh, uh, business, uh, business goals. And also this uh, methodology, it has, a, um, how to say it? It's, uh, it's fun, so the people enjoy to, to, to be part of it. So I've seen the, the, the guy that has been quiet for three days in the room. When you start doing this, he starts to collaborate. This is awesome, because you get the involvement of everybody. So, should we? Yep. Yeah, this is also very interesting. So we, we have the, 
The project outline is clear now. So we have the, the post-its on the wall, we have, we have the timeline set, we know what we're doing, we know why we're doing it. And now comes the greenfield approach that turns out to be the brownfield stinky uh, thing. So the, here is where you take an inventory of all these brownfield elements. This could be technical, right? The hardware is already ordered. This is what you have to work with. Or we have a hardware contract and these are the models that come with it. Or you have uh, some security uh, uh, things that you need to uh, that you need to take care of, but they could also be business, right? So uh, 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 a long-term business on how a long-term view on how the business is doing is the budget uh, realistic, or or uh, uh, how how are you with manpower? Really have a good look at it because people get enthusiastic, say I can do it, I want to do it. Uh, uh, we see a lot of companies building a virtual team, people that do that. Uh, do this along along the side. So you have part-time storage uh, uh, admin, start-time, uh, part-time uh, uh, database people helping out. Really see the limitation in the manpower and don't go too optimistic because it will bite you in places you won't expect. And the same uh, uh, with process software certification. We see it in a lot of companies. This does take a lot of time, isn't it, Alberto? Yeah. yeah. So we, we see sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months, just people, and it's not only the process, it's sometimes just the people not being available to accept the request and, and uh, follow up on it. I'm sure there are many people, well, this is the time where you can uh, release some of this energy and frustration that comes with it. So does anyone uh, want to uh, chip in on this one? I also understand that you don't want to, it's, it's a bit of the, the, the dirty laundry. I can ask you, <laughs> Yeah. So, can you give me a technical constraint that you have in your company? A technical constraint, uh, pure technical, so on the detail of let's say an OS, yeah. the, the OS version, is I've worked with the company that said, uh, I know you have some, some newer versions of your uh, real enterprise Linux, uh, uh, we want to work with RHEL 7, but RHEL 6 is the only certified version that we currently have. Right? So then you, take, you need to take into account the time it takes to certify the whole, whole OS. Right? So do you, do you think that is much better? What do you think that is better? Try an earlier release, a previous release, and deploy now with RHEL, 7, with RHEL 6? and upgrade when you have your new RHEL 7 certified? Or do you think that the best way is use part of the budget of the project to get certified the new release of the so operating system? In a particular case of the OS, and then uh, for instance, for your, as a base for your cloud deployment, your RHEL OSP or your OpenStack platform is gonna be tied into the, uh, uh, the Red Hat release. So there's no real way around it. So you either ask for an exception to this rule, uh, or you, uh, and then you probably need to take into to consideration that you need to build it in an isolated environment for the time being, or maybe for the long term, or that you uh, uh, go into the process and, and delay the project for as long as the certification so take, takes. It is clear that we have to include this step in the project. Definitely. Okay. But um, let's turn it around. Can you name something um, in the process category. The process category. So, yeah, so security is my, my preferred topic. So my company is a bank. Mm -hmm. We need to pass certain regula regulations. And in order to be compliant with, the reg with these regulations, you have to share your design with me. And it will take one month for me to be win your design, I will provide feedback that I can assure you that nobody has passed this, uh, this review, all good. So there will be something that you have to change. And after that, once you have uh, deployed this in production, I will make sure that what you promise is there. So I will execute penetration testing. That is pretty good, but this is exposed during a, a discovery session. And uh, what happens if, if, the, if, if your stakeholder at the discovery session says, yeah, yeah, these regulations, they will come later? What will you do? 
then what, what we have, we, that will happen is that the company cannot go to production with something that cannot pass the regulation. For instance, I can give you the, an example in, in Spain, the banks has to pass this, this test from the uh, National Bank. So you cannot go to production with something that cannot pass the regulation of the Spanish bank. So you will be delayed in the project. And the problem is the delay, the, the delay you include in the project when some, you know, including this team in early stages during the discovery session is, is, low, is lower than the one when you want to onboard them at the end of the project, when you have a need. So you are trying to, to, to gather the request, the, to, to make the request for the resources, and the guys are not going to be there because they are not available just for you. They work for the company. So you will, get, you will have to wait for these resources to be able to be onboarded on the project. So doing things in a rush is never the right thing to do. And I think this is also, again, a, a really good argument why you need a project manager at this stage of the game. Because these constraints need to be recorded, they need to be enforced, and uh, um, otherwise you'll, you'll, you'll be in trouble. Because this is not something that you want to make, the, uh, make uh, uh, put on the task list of your architect. This is clearly something that is identified, then recorded, and then enforced. You don't need to, um, uh, to put your architect in charge of this. Okay, let's move. Last step. What's the outcome of this? What do you think? Now we combine everything. So it's not the last? Is it the last? What do you think? So what do you think? Is the last one? The last step? I'm excited. <laughs> so, I told you. I'm from the south of Spain, I can speak all the time. <laughs> so guys, you don't want to speak? Okay, I will do it. So now, the funny, st the funny thing, we are going to design something. So we have all the information, isn't it? So we know, the fund you, we know the context, we know why you want to do this. We know your business drivers, we know the timelines, we know the user stories, we have priorities, we have the roadmap, so we can start designing the thing, isn't it? Now is when we can go to a whiteboard, and start drawing boxes. Don't go to technical, because do you remember the risks? If you go to technical too early, you're going to fail. So now start drawing boxes. Like, uh, I know that I have to integrate with uh, ServiceNow. Let's put ServiceNow down there. But don't write down all deep technical thing about how you are going to integrate with ServiceNow. This will come back later during the design phase of the project. Is it? Uh, Clear so far? Do you agree? Yeah? So how do you do it in your company? This thing. How do you do the first draft of your architecture when it comes to deploy OpenStack? Anybody? I want to know the information you have when you start drawing the, the, the draft. Do you have all this information? Are you missing something? Do you think that this design is valid? or you will need to iterate afterwards and onboard new requirements on the fly. So. Yep, the gentleman. Oh, thank you. Good. Oh, oh. yeah. Uh, you need to iterate every time. But that be, 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 because the, the needs of the, of the business will change. Do you think that it's because the business changed and you, you have new use cases and you had to pass all the process again? So you had to discover the changes, yeah. design based on the new, in the new use cases, mm -hmm. and then deploy. But you think that when you start designing the first draft or during this iteration, when you start at the design phase, do you have all this information always? The timeline, the main business, uh, the main business case, the business drivers, everything, always. Ooh, uh, not at first, but yeah, it could, it could be changed. Okay, so my experience. Thank you. My experience is that you still receive this information during the design phase. So once you have defined the effort, once you have defined the roadmap then someone goes during the design phase and say, look, I wasn't in the meeting, so I'm going to introduce my new requirements. 
So, yeah, this. Ah, okay. <laughs> but according to your experience, is the reality, or it is better to go to smaller uh, objectives and then make it grow? So with that form. I mean, is it better to get the requirement for all the teams and then start to build it, or get smaller milestones? Let me say that. Definitely. If every stakeholder that will be involved in the project needs to be engaged before the project starts. Because they, otherwise, they are going to be onboarded later on. But even if you are not uh, building the objectives from the beginning, I mean... Careful. That, that's why you have a roadmap. So correct. The, the, that's correct. So these guys want to do something at some point. Maybe it's not a priority for the project, but you need to know that they want to do something because otherwise you cannot prioritize, uh, create a priority based on that. So you, it's, you are missing information. So we are, what we are trying to do with the discovery session is avoid missing information. Okay, so you get all the requirements, you create a roadmap, you agree with the roadmap with all the different departments, and then you start building, but at any time you meet. It's an iteration. Yeah, okay. The, the idea is uh, with these uh, huge cloud projects, you don't want to build a Ferrari in the first iteration mm -hmm. because you are going to fail. Uh, or if you, if you success, you are going to success in 10 years mm -hmm. because you don't know how to build a Ferrari. So you need to learn how to de de create the Ferrari, start building the, the wheels, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So it's better if you build something that covers your your priorities, so your main business case. What's your priority? What do you want to achieve? Let's go for it. When you have this, because this is something that you can achieve in certain amount of time, isn't it? And you can, you can estimate when you are going to have it. And you know how to do it, so let's do it. Then, it, putting you an, an example with this Ferrari, and I, start, I, I need to go from point A to point B. So I can choose the Ferrari, I can choose the car, I can go by bicycle. Bicycle is going to get me to point B. But at some point in the roadmap, because I'm a lazy guy, I don't want to do exercise. So at some point in roadmap, I need to add an engine to the bicycle. Do you know what I mean? And then at some point, based on the effort, budget, and, uh, and this, uh, uh, more or less, the effort you are putting in the, in the environment, you are getting more usability, stability, maturity of the product. But always focusing on having something that is viable and then covers your main use case. So this making sense for you guys? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Uh, Julio? I know you, right? Hmm. Hi, I'm, I'm Julio. I am the equivalent of Berto in the US. So, back, back to what you, were with, you guys were saying, I think that the important part of this uh, preparation is that you will get everybody on the same room. That's really important. All the stakeholders will be there. You will capture use cases. And back to what Alberto was saying about rowing boxes, you are not going to provide answers to all the use cases during your discovery session. Because your discovery session, you need to look at from, like a, pro, from a project manager point of view, it's like a kickoff of the project. If you're getting everybody there, you're capturing what needs to happen, and then, the, the, the most important part as I try to do, I don't couple dozen of this, is to define phases or the roadmap, uh, uh, your project roadmap. It's like what you will get from each phase of your project. It's like Bar has been saying a fantastic terminology, and it's how you will get a minimum viable product that you could iterate and you could start to answer use cases through your process, right? Because they show. Uh, a, a, a graph there that is how we do things at Red Hat and it's our discover, design, deploy. And this is phase one. Phase two is you have your use cases and then you go into design phase. And then you deploy. But that doesn't mean that after your discovery session, you, you may have a minimal architecture that you could deploy, that you could start testing, that your people from operations could start familiarizing with the platform. Like, no. You come to these events and you say, oh, OpenStack is a good technology. Your people need to prove that. You need to get used to the technology. You need, you, you need to understand it. So that's why this is so important. And you asked a really good question in how to get there. Thank you.
Thank you, Julio. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see that we, uh, we have, we have uh, um, synergy between EMEA and uh, North America to do so in this, doing this. Yeah? This is a good, good point. Stuff. Keep in mind that the... <laughs> good. <laughs> this is a, a really good point. This is a company-wide methodology of doing things. This guy is from North America. I am from Spain. We do the things in the same way because we know that it works. Yeah, and representing it here as a as a as an open way of doing things. So the the, the slides are there, and it's not really hard to uh, uh, to to have this conversation within your within your company. So um, uh, you, you can take take your lead here. Are we done yet, Alberto? Yes. So thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Where now? So. We, Julio said, we are building a project, isn't it? So we are in the discovery phase. At some point, we had to write down everything and estimate efforts and see how much money I need to, to do this stuff, how, my, how many people I need to onboard in the... And this is where we create the backlog. Okay. This is not the backlog. Oops. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> so the, oh, the link, is, yeah. So we have a nice uh, high-level architecture. So you see that we have our OpenStack controllers. We have decided that we are going to integrate with certain CI, CD. An identity provider is there. An automation tool is in there to deploy workloads, and so on and so forth. So how I can create a project from this? Create the project backlog. So following the arrows, there will be a task in the backlog that will say, design the integration of the workload CI, CD with the OpenStack, OpenStack APIs. The same will happen with automation tool for infrastructure. The same will happen with the infrastructure CI/CD, and so on and so forth. This is at the end of this phase. What you will have is a project backlog with all the tasks that you are going to do. So you you know how much time and effort you need to execute certain tasks. So you can start putting money, manpower against certain tasks, and then you can create the project and you know how to plan this project with the project matches. Does it make sense for you guys? Have you done more or less something like this? This is something common in... Is this actually, uh, is this the same as uh, what we see in Agile? Or it uses some of these technologies that yep. you know, or, or methods, yeah. So do you use project backlog? The, the official name is product backlog. I modify it just to... Mm. Do you use it? Do you like it? Is it useful? So, and also I find that the project backlog is also useful for basing future iterations on. So basically, uh, your pro uh, when you've done your project backlog, at some point you draw a line where, where the current uh, iteration ends, basically your minimal viable project product. And then you have, uh, then you already have the basis for uh, for future iterations, for future improvements. That's great. Right. Yeah. So it it also helps all the other squads in the internal teams know each other backlog, and they can expect when the features will be ready. So it's, it make it visible to everybody. Yes. Anybody else? No? Okay. So... so I have to do this, sorry. Yeah. So as I said, this is an open kind of way of working. It, it's uh, it's a, a, a sort of a, a best practice. This is what we think you should start with in projects, and you could do this as individuals in your in your organization. You can also invite Red Hat to come and do this with you. Then we can then we can supply a very knowledgeable and experienced architect uh, like like ourselves and and Julio in uh, in North America. And uh, can we show the next slide? And as we uh, as we seen here, 
there are two modes in which we can do this. We can do this quite adaptive, where we just go and collect these parameters for your project. And if we have the right stakeholders and the, and the right attitude in, in the room, we can actually go in and develop this topic. So you leave with more developed topics than we actually came in with. Right, so actually to, to talk about it, to have all the stakeholders in the room sharing ideas guided by an experienced architect and maybe even the project manager at this stage is a very good idea. Uh, um, the, the, the worst thing you could happen, uh, you, you could do is that you have all your, uh, uh, your requirements and everything we've gone through uh, recorded in either a, a Trello board and a, and a report or uh, something more tangible in JIRA, and, and you'll get a whole uh, uh, project uh, uh, description out of it. So this is what we do. So use cases, challenges, um, uh, potential technologies and solutions. Uh, we, 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 we most times are invited to talk about OpenStack, but then we, 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 we find that uh, there's more to cover, right? Yeah. So this is what we do in a discovery session. It's a single day setup. Sometimes we do it multiple days. Um, and we go through the topics that we've seen in the, in the tiles. Yeah. So follow up on that is um, we do the discovery session. It's a one day or, or half a day, maybe two days, depending on, uh, on the complexity and, uh, and, uh, of, the, of the case. Uh, normally, we, we then take what we've learned in the discovery session and, and use that in a design phase where we actually go through and, and create a high level design, mapping the requirements to productability and uh, uh, making sure we can deploy it within the set uh, uh, timeline. So these are solution sprints and depending on what we find in the discovery phase and work out in the design phase, this may take uh, a long time, may, may take a short time, but this is all very much uh, based on the, uh, the business driver and the constraints that we see. And this is then for the, uh, for the single iterations, but we can repeat this for all the, all the use cases. So I think we've uh, arrived at the end of the talk. Yeah. Um, if there are any more questions or remarks. So we, have, we do have some architects in the room, like uh, Julio and ourselves. So if you're interested in, 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 in a one-to-one -one conversation, you're very welcome to, to, to join us in front of the, of, uh, of the stage here and just uh, have a conversation about it. Or we can uh, show you to uh, one of the architects in the room. You can go to the Red Hat booth. Is a you can you cannot miss it. It's just the first one you see <laughs> yeah, in yeah. the marketplace. That is true. So yeah, look for us if you want to know more about this. So and thank you. Thank you.